la la la. <laughs> I'll begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dearly Father, we uh, thank you for this day, and we thank you for the students. This class, we just ask you to be glorified if we do this day, Lord. In your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Okay, so, um, last time, I gave you a powerful demonstration of why you should never use Cartesian coordinates to solve a spherical coordinate problem. Right? Because that's basically at the heart of why that calculation I got stuck last time on was just so insidious. It's because, like, the Coulomb field is a spherical problem, right? It's a spherical question, really. And so, in a nutshell, just to recap, if we have um, the force is equal to, what does it go? How's it go? K, uh, Q, Q. Um, you know, over r squared r hat, right? And I set that equal to minus the gradient of some potential energy function, then the smart thing to do here is to realize that, oh, given the symmetry involved, this is just minus, you know, um, partial u, partial r. And, and really, I can do better than that. It's not even a partial derivative. It's really a total derivative because there's only an R dependence here. So minus du dr R hat, right? And so just to recap briefly, we're just trying to solve um, du dr equals to, um, you know, minus kqq over R squared. And then we integrate, right? And this gives us um, that u of R is equal to KQQ over R um, plus some constant, right? So there you go. This is the potential energy um, for the QQ system, right? It's the electric potential energy that's stored somehow in the electric field. Um, which mediates the electric force between these two charges. You sold that faster than last time. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I, I've learned a little bit. But, I mean, I think the calculation I went through last time is worth seeing. It's just not worth doing. Right? I mean, if I had a physics, if I had physics majors, you know, unwilling, unwilling participa participants in some higher level course, then I could put that upon them in their homework. But um, I have no such victims, so I can only victimize myself and make myself do it. So I did that. But I think if you watch the video that I posted, you know, you can understand that me bailing was a good idea. All right? So anyway, that is the potential energy between two charges. So like, and um, remember, if this, if this is the net force involved, um, say on, on, the, on a mass, if we think about, you know, charge Q with mass M, then if we write the energy is equal to, you know, one half mv squared um, plus what, uh, U of R, Oh, well, this is, this is constant, right? So, um, among other things, you can calculate then that the, um, <clears throat> and, and notice something here. The change in potential energy, right? If we were to say calculate U of, um, well, the book likes to use A and B, so I'll use that for a change here. Um, you know, RA and RB. So if I was, was to calculate the, uh, the potential energy that, that, that would, would change if I was to say to go from radius A to radius B, well, there's something, something to notice here, right? Which is that that is, uh, well, KQQ over RB plus U naught minus KQQ 
over RA uh, plus U naught. And what happens to the zero of the potential energy? It cancels out, that's right. So physically speaking, what the zero is for potential energy, it, it doesn't have a, a direct physical meaning, right? Uh, you, you have a freedom to choose the zero for potential energy and it's not directly physical, right? On the other hand, the change in potential energy definitely is something that's visually, physically measurable. And if I rewrite this, we can rewrite this as, let's say, K, KQ um, times 1 over uh, RB minus 1 over RA, all of that times, well, I'll put the Q second here, all right? So what we're looking at then is what this is, is, by the way, this is the voltage of RB minus the voltage of RA times Q. Or if you like, you could write the change in the voltage um, times Q. Um, let's see here, other notation. Sometimes like the book likes to use the notation um, VAB, I think. <coughs> and um, times Q, or if you let me continue in this litany of um, notation, VB minus VA times Q, right? These are other formulas that we like to talk about. So the change in voltage times the charge, that gives me the change in potential energy in this, in this situation. And what's this equal to? This would be equal to, um, so remember that um, the change in kinetic energy is equal to minus the change in potential energy, right? So that would actually be equal to minus, you know, the change in the voltage times Q, if you're keeping track of everything here. So there's this relation between the speed of the mass, right, and the change in the voltage, right? We could think about before and after situations where you know, you have two charges initially at rest and suppose they move. Now how fast is it moving after the, you know, after the situation changes? Like for example, suppose I have Q here, right? I have big Q down here. They're originally a distance, let's say, R apart, right? And then and then this is before, and then after. I have Q here, right? And a distance R apart. So if I say that I have, you know, initial velocity equal to zero, my question is, and this is the mass, this is the mass, then I can say, What's my, what's my final velocity in such a situation? Right, what, what are the equations that govern this? And did I say R over 2? I meant to say R over 2 just to make it clear. So like, so afterwards, these two are closer. And for the purpose of this discussion, we're imagining that the big Q is like somehow glued in place. All right, it can't move around, all right? Are we, are we understand the situation? So then the question is, what's the speed of, of the mass in the, in, in the after? Can you guys tell me? How do we do it? Yeah, ki the kinematics here. So we have to do what? We have to say the change in kinetic energy is equal to minus the change in potential energy, right? And what is that? So, so we have you know, um, K, Q, Q, um, so the final energy is, is R divided by R over 2, right, minus K, Q, Q over R, right, that, 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 right, what I wrote in parentheses, what I wrote in parentheses right there is just the change in potential energy, right, final minus initial, do we agree? I hope. But notice there's a minus here I have to deal with. 
So, all right, great. That, that gives me what? Um, I guess I can factor out the KQQ out here, right? And so I've got like 1 over R um, minus apparently 2 over R, right? Which I believe is minus KQQ over R, right? On the other hand, what's the change? What's the what's the change in kinetic energy equal to? You guys remember one half mv squared, right? So we have one half mv f squared. Minus one half mv naught squared. But what did we say about v naught? Zero. So our formula the final velocity apparently is equal to um, minus 2kqq um, divided by uh, mr. Square root that thing. There you go. Now my question to you is does this make sense? I hear one resounding no. <laughs> Any other votes? If we all come to a no, then I guess the answer is no, because as you know, science is judged by consensus. You have to trust the science, which means trust other people who say trust the science. Yeah. What's that? It makes sense. <laughs> it makes sense. I think this part makes sense, yes. but this formula is a little bit off-putting, isn't it? Looks like I've got the square root of a negative thing, right? That seems like a problem, right? So if, so if, if Q and Q, um, well, let's, say, let's just say it this way. If QQ is greater than zero, then this motion is forbidden. <laughs> because why? To quote my little brother, Cusby Y, you know? That was one of his sayings when he was about three or four. You're like, why do you do that, Andrew? Cusby Y. <clears throat> teaches literature now. Um, so, um, all right, so the reason, if, if, if the product of Q and Q was positive, then this is the square, as, as you see, we end up solving for an imaginary velocity, which of course is unphysical, right? More to the point, if QQ, right, if QQ is, is, uh, um, is positive, then this is negative, but this is positive. You can't solve that, right? You can't have a positive kinetic energy if you've got a negative term over here. Now, notice that that could be remedied if we had an initial velocity, right? If my initial velocity was big enough, then the equation still works out, right? So it could, it, this could still be repaired if the situation wasn't that the initial velocity was zero. If we have some speed to start with, then we can trade some kinetic energy for potential energy and we can still make sense of this. On the other hand, if, um, if we have QQ is negative, then okay, just what I have. See, because if KQ is negative, then, then that's actually the square root of a positive number, right? Should we think about this physically? What is the difference here? These mathematical observations I've made, what, what does it mean to say that the product of two charges is positive? What's that mean? What are the possible patterns there? How can you get the product of two things being positive? You either got what? Yeah, you, yeah, you either got plus plus or minus minus, right? 
But down here, you've either got plus minus or minus plus. And what's the situation? How does the electric force work? Like charges repel and unlike charges attract, right? So the electric force would pull the mass towards the, you know, the fixed charge in the cases that the charges differ, which is when we get a physically reasonable velocity. On the flip side, if the charges are both the same, either positive or negative, then the electric force, I'm sorry, the other way around. Yeah, if, if there, excuse me, I'll, I'll get back to it. So, sorry, I lost my track. Where was I? So if they have, um, if they got the same, if they have the same, the, the same polarity, either plus plus or minus minus, then the electric force is repulsive, right? So it's impossible to achieve this motion unless there's something else at, at play, right? There has to be a third party involved to like push them together to add energy to the system. Otherwise, on its own, on its lonesome, the electric force cannot produce this result. Does that make sense? So that's, that's how this all works. Um, so we can use conservation of energy to solve kinematic problems like this. Now, um, and, and then just remember that there's a distinction, potential energy versus voltage, right? Potential energy is what? what what's voltage rather? P change in voltage is equal to the change in potential energy per unit charge, right? So that's what we have to think about <clears throat> as we think about problems like this. Now I'd like to talk more about the voltage function and, and how it works and what its properties are now that we've done this, you know, application here. So, although I suppose I, eh, we're, we're, while we're on this, let's talk about the energy required to um, build some different charge configurations, right? So like, how much energy to build these, you know, charge configurations. And so the, the name of the game here is we're asking the question like how much energy is basically stored in having charges arranged in a certain way, right? So see, if I go back to my example one, you can also think about this in terms of like a spring, right? You can think about the electric force like a spring um, because if the charges are, um, if the charges are the same, if it's plus plus or minus minus, then what's it doing? It's repelling like, right? It's repelling, it's like a compressed spring. So it's trying to stretch out, right? But if the charges differ, then it's like a string, a spring which is stretched out and it's trying to pull the, pull the mass back, right? So you can either think about it either it is a spring either stretched or compressed. You can think about it that way. Um, and, and you can also think about it in terms of gravity, right? In fact, the, the Coulomb force law was the universal gravitational law, right? Like the reciprocal dependence. And if you think back, if you think back to, um, I, should, I should really mention this. I should have mentioned this earlier, my bad. This is, you know, like the fact that we have U is equal to, um, G, how's it go, G, GMM over R, but there's a minus, and the minus is there because um, of the fact that gravity's attractive. And you may recall from like first semester physics that we looked at this as the gravitational potential and we talked about like bound, bound orbits and such. So like all of that, is almost the same mathematics as this, you know. Um, but there's a significant difference in that the gravity is always attractive, whereas the electric force could be attractive or repulsive. So the, the analogy only goes so far. All right, so <clears throat> my next question is how much energy to build these charge configurations? So we'll start out with just, how about just one? So you take a charge, um, we'll call it Q1, and we just stick it here. How much energy does it take? You, now you imagine that you're taking Q1 
from way on out and you're just sticking it there, how much energy does that take? Well, you have to, this is, takes a lot of imagination, but you have to imagine a completely blank universe with nothing else in it. And the answer is, well, no energy. It's just sitting there. There's nothing else for it to interact with, so it costs nothing. Now, I bring in Q2, right? A distance, um, well, we'll say D1. Let me, let me call this, well, fine, uh, D1, 2, then. This is the distance from 1 to 2. So now, what's the energy? Well, it, it, it took, um, uh, so the potential energy now is what? We got ourselves a um, K Q1, Q2 divided by the distance from 1 to 2. Like that's how much potential energy there is in that system. So it would take that much energy to bring in charge 2 from really, really far away and bring it that close, right? Now, if they both have the same sign, it, it takes work to do that, right? I actually, it's kind of like compressing a spring to bring Q2 close to Q1. On the other hand, if they have different sign, then it takes negative work, right? It just naturally, Q1 gets goes in that far. And, and, if, and if nothing else stopped it, it would just keep going until they collide, right? There's nothing to stop Q1 from going to Q2 if they've got different signs. They're just attractive, right? What happens to two? They should just come together unless there's something to stop them. But there you go. That's the potential energy for two charges. How about three? So imagine, you know, adding Q3 to the mix. And I'll draw the picture down here. So we've got Q1, we've got Q2, and now we're bringing Q3 in, right? I should use a different color here. Um, the question is how much energy, how much work do you have to do to bring Q3 there, right? You, so you, it, you have to work against the electric force from both of the existing charges that are already there, right? Um, so we've got D1, 2, this distance here is D2, 3, this distance here I'll call D1, 3 for the lack of imagination. So we have potential energy between 2 and 3 and potential energy between 1 and 3 that we're building up in this situation, right? So the net energy that it costs to put all three of these in place like that is, so I'll just call it the total potential energy would be what we already took, you know, what it costs us to bring one and two together, right? Plus the potential energy it costs to bring one and three together, which is KQ1, Q3 divided by D1, 3. And then plus KQ2, Q3 divided by um, D2, 3. Did I do something wrong? No? So that's the, that would be the potential energy. Now, and, and if you want to like continue this idea, right? If you want to continue this idea, maybe it would be interesting to think about it for n charges instead of just, you know, three. How much potential energy would we have for n charges? And, and so to, uh, to simplify things a bit, I'm going to um, <clears throat> I think I'm going to call the I'm going to I'm going to just I'm going to put the first one at the origin for our convenience. All right? I'm going to put the first one at the origin and then I'm just going to number the rest of them like 1 2 3 so forth all the way out to n minus 1. If that makes sense to you guys. So here's the situation. I'm going to put like q here. Right? And then I'm going to put maybe Q1 here and Q2 here and Q3 here and so forth and so on, all right? Until I get to like the nth one or the n minus one one, yeah? <clears throat> um, 
Um, oh, oh, I'm sorry, guys. No, 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 I don't want to do this. <laughs> I do not want to do this. I'm sorry, I am... No. No. This is not a problem we solve. I don't know what this is I'm starting to do, but this is not a problem we concern ourselves with. This is much, much more horrible than anything we do in here. Let me not, let me stop this right now. Oh, no, 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 no. My apologies. Oh, this is bad. This is very, very bad. I'd have to consider all possible pairings. Uh, there's... What, so that's n choose, I need n choose two terms. So you guys know combinatorics, how many is n choose two? It's, it's a lot. It's, 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 it's a lot. I'm just saying this gets worse if we add, if, if, I, if I was to ask you to like, if I was to ask you to calculate the potential energy due to like putting 10 charges together, it would be more annoying. You just have to keep track of all possible pairings. And, and you also have to think about putting them in in sequence, you know? Because like the first one's free, and the second one only, you only have to bring in against the first one. And the third one, you only have to bring in against the first two, and, and so forth. So you have, to, it's like a, you have to think about it in stages to calculate the net energy that it takes to build a, a system of charge. All right. Anyway, the, that's a standard homework question. I almost certainly put it in your next mission, all right? So that's why I was talking about it. Usually I'll do something like put them in a triangle or put them on a square so you can figure out the lengths between the charges easily and, and so forth. All right. So get to the point here. <clears throat> so in summary, we found... that the electric field should be equal to, um, well, just to recap, we, we know that the electric field should be equal to the net force divided by Q, right? But if we have the potential energy for the net force, that's 1 over Q times, you know, uh, minus the, the gradient of the potential energy. But that is minus the gradient of the potential energy divided by the charge, which is minus the gradient of the voltage. So this is very nice, um, actually. So to find, let me just write it down here again, the electric field is minus the gradient of the voltage function. And this is very interesting because if we consider a charge under the influence of the electric field that has voltage V, we can understand the change in kinetic energy for that charge as it relates to the change in voltage for the charge. So far being, it's not just something that's useful to find electric fields, although it is that. It's more than that. Um, here, let, let's, let's work a specific one. So like example, let me just do a math example. That'll be easier for us for the moment. So this was example one. This was example, I guess this is example two. This is example three for three charges. And then example N, um, we decided to bail on. So that makes this example four. Suppose my voltage was like alpha xy plus beta x squared minus y squared, for instance. If this is the voltage, all right, here alpha and beta are given constants, okay? Then the question is, what's the electric field? So given this potential, find the electric field. There's no trash, there's no trash can in here, is there? But these are all trash. All right, 
So apparently this is a, a two-dimensional problem, right? So here we go. The electric field is minus the gradient of the voltage, which is also called the potential. So that's going to be minus partial partial x of this expression. Comma minus partial partial y of this business right here. Great. So can we, we, we can take these partial derivatives, right? I guess you guys aren't quite to partial differentiation in Calc 3 yet, are you? You're still like calculating curvature of curves and tangent lines to paths and stuff like that at the moment. Yeah. Soon you will learn partial differentiation. But you will already know it because you're taking my physics 2 class. Woohoo! But actually you already know it because you took calculus 1. So you know how to differentiate one variable pretending the other one's constant, right? So the partial derivative with respect to x means y is a constant. So this is just minus alpha y minus 2 beta x. That's it. The x derivative gives me 1, the y rides along, the other one gives me 2x, and that beta y squared term is just constant with respect to the x derivative. And let's see here, this next one, we get what? Partial differentiate with respect to y, the x rides along, so I get alpha minus alpha x, um, and then minus a minus gives me a plus 2 beta y. There you go. That's the electric field in this situation. If you were to put a charge, Q, in the influence of this electric field, the force it would experience would be Q times that vector at that point, x, y. Now, now you can ask the question, how do you get a voltage function like that? Don't ask that. The answer is it would take a very complicated distribution of charge to make this happen. <laughs> but it makes a nice calculus example, so just let me have it, please. Let me, let me just have an unphysical but mathematically easy example, right? Um, but obviously a deeper looming question for us is how do we find the voltage functions for our standard examples, right? So I've showed you how to find the voltage function for the Coulomb field. Can we? Can we get past that? Can we find the voltage function for more charges? How's that go? Yeah? Any questions about this? Is, should I do another? How about this? Example five. What if my voltage is equal to like, um, let's say, alpha times x? And this is in 3D, okay? So then the, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll put a minus here just to be annoying. Um, then <clears throat> the gradient of V um, would be what? It would be uh, partial partial X of minus alpha X, partial partial Y of minus alpha X partial partial z of minus alpha x. If we're in 3D, the gradient's got the z, x, and y derivatives. But what is this equal to? Apparently, minus alpha. And this guy and that guy are both zero. See the partial derivative of x with respect to y and the partial derivative of um, x with respect to z are both zero. So what's this tell me? It tells me that my electric field is what? Um, apparently minus gradient of V, which in this case is what? Alpha, zero, zero. So, hmm. So let me, let, me, let me flip this around a bit. If I have the electric field, 
that would say E naught times Y hat. Can you guys tell me what voltage function I should give? What, what, what voltage function should I write down for that? E not Y? Good guess. And we need a minus. Why is that? Because, yeah, we need a minus E not Y for that. But if you take the gradient of minus E not times Y, we get back you know, exactly that electric field. So like, see the gradient of minus E naught Y is, you can pull the E naught out as a constant. What's the gradient of Y? It is zero, one, zero. And that is exactly, but you, I gotta remember the <laughs> See, this thing will, you have to keep this minus in mind, all right? So that minus then undoes this minus, and we get that, you know, this is in fact the correct formula for the voltage. What if we had a constant electric field in the z direction? How would that go? So like example seven, what if I had my electric field was, you know, E naught Z hat, what would the formula be for the voltage in that situation? Wouldn't that just be negative E naught Z? Minus E naught Z, very good. There you go. See, it doesn't have to be hard. Like, here are some. In the case of a constant electric field, you simply use the coordinate that goes along the direction of the electric field times minus the magnitude of that constant field. That's how it goes. Um, where would this come up? Like, have we had a constant electric field anywhere? Where would this where would this relevant where would this kind of formula be relevant? How about a capacitor? Right? Remember we talked about if you have two conducting plates. Um, so like if I had um, for instance You know, maybe I have um, a charge sigma up here. I've got a charge minus sigma down here, right? And what was the, what was the electric? What's the electric field between two large plates like that? If we have those charge densities, which way do the field lines go? Up. I was, I was not really questioning, the up is, um, oh yeah, it's not up, it's, I mean 50-50, so you, you win some, you lose some, right? So yeah, down, because they have to flow out of the positive charge and into the negative charge, so there's your field lines, right? So the electric field is actually going to be equal to, um, and so these are co conducting plates, so we get actually um, two sigma over epsilon naught z hat but a minus because it's going down right if i'm choosing z to be the upward direction so um so like i'm thinking this is the z direction okay guys so what's the voltage then So the voltage would be what? Two, yeah, two sigma over epsilon naught times what? Times Z. Now, 
admittedly, we should say plus a constant, right? I mean, because you can set the voltage to be zero wherever you like, right? But in this situation, the voltage should be constant along a particular choice of z, right? The voltage should be constant if we look at a horizontal line here. What's the change in voltage between the plates? So I, I guess I probably need to tell you, you know, like a, na a name for the distance between the plates. The usual name that we use in here is D for the distance between the capacitor plates, D, distance between the plates, right? So um, we could do like V of D minus V of zero. If I, if I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna say, you know, this right here is Z equal to zero for the sake of specificity. We can make Z equal to zero wherever we like, right? Let's just make it there. And if we do that, what's the difference in the voltages here? Well, the V naught doesn't matter, right? So we've got two sigma D over epsilon naught. Two sigma D over epsilon naught minus zero, right? So apparently the voltage <coughs> across the capacitor plate is, well, it's directly proportional to the charge on the plates and the distance between the plates, apparently, <coughs> as I've currently set things up. Hmm. Anyway, we have much more to learn about capacitors. I'm just pointing out that we can set up the voltage between the plates like this here. All right. And the voltage should be proportional to the distance from one plate to the other. Now, there's, there's, there's some bigger um, things to think about here, which is like, what's, what's the geometric relation between the electric field and the voltage? You guys think about this? What does it mean geometrically? We, we, we write this formula down, right? And I still have much more to say about this, right? So like next class, I'll talk about how we go past just one charge. We talk about building the voltage from taking multiple charges and we'll add the voltage from each charge up together. Um, um, so, but what does this like geometrically mean? What's the relation between the voltage function and the vector field E? Do you guys know how this, what this means? Maybe not yet. So um, what this geometrically means is that the electric field lines are perpendicular to the constant voltage lines. constant voltage curves. Now the constant voltage curves have a special name. These are called equipotentials, which is just fancy speak for equal voltage <laughs> equipotentials. And the field lines we've already talked about, right? We needed those to understand Gauss's law. Now if you look at my examples today, you can see all this at play, right? Like, um, so here, look back at my example eight, right? The the volt the um, here's the here's the E field lines. Where's the voltage? If I draw the voltage equipotential lines in green, they look like this, right? Voltage equal to a constant, right? So like voltage equal to say V one, voltage equal to V two. What's the situation there? Is V1 higher voltage or is V2 higher voltage? Like what's the deal? Notice that we have two, so as you go up, so like um, V1 is a lower voltage equipotential line than V2. So what's the situation? The electric field pushes positive charges, right? in such a direction that it goes to lower voltage. See, the, if you put a little test charge in here, plus Q, 
the electric field lines indicate the direction the electric force will pull, pull the charge, right? And it's going from lines of higher voltage to lines of lower voltage. That's also implicit in here. The E field lines are perpendicular to the voltage curves and um, the electric field points to direction needed to lower voltage. One more example for today and then we'll, we'll call it quits here. But if we go back to the Coulomb field, what's the field lines look like for the Coulomb field? I'll just do it two dimensional, right? But here's your, here's your field lines, right? Is that enough? Is this enough? I don't know. Let's suppose we got a positive charge, right? So the electric field is, you know, um, diverging from the origin, right? So this is the E equal to um, KQ over R squared field, right? The Coulomb field. And what did we find the voltage was for that? Remember, after much suffering, I proved that the voltage for this character is KQ over R, right? And here R is the square root of X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared. So what does that make the... So I said that we have equal potential curves. That's a lie, unless we're in two dimensions. See, in three dimensions, we tend to have an equipotential surface, right? There's going to be a whole surface in which you have constant voltage. So if I, if I look at voltage equal to a constant, what do I get? See, equal to V, you know, V1, that gives me R is KQ over V1. So you tell me the voltage, V1, I tell you the radius of the equipotential curve is KQ over V1. And so if you want me to draw those, they look like this. And what's the situation? As you go further and further out, are we lowering the voltage or are we raising the voltage? K lowering, right? KQ over R drops to zero as R goes to infinity. And again, this is that perpendicularity I was talking about. Now, this is just a two-dimensional representation, right? The truth is you have equipotential spheres, right? There's an equipotential sphere, and the electric fields are poking out of those, normal to the spheres, right? That's what's going on here. But in two dimensions, like if you could, if you were so bold as to plot, <laughs> I don't recommend it, but if you were to look at this equal to a constant, you get a whole family of ugly curves that fill the plane. The lines which are perpendicular to those would be indicative of the electric field lines. That's how this works. Voltage is perpendicular to the electric field lines. And the electric field line points in the direction needed to lower voltage, which is, by the way, for a positive charge, the direction of physically allowed motions, right? Unless you have kinetic energy to use up to convert to electric potential energy, right? You can, if you already have kinetic energy in your charge, you can, you know, circumvent my example I did today. Anyway, that's it for today, so I'll shut up, let you guys go.